podcast today, I have a special guest, and I say that because he is my dad, Ted Woolsey, um, currently residing in Joliet, Illinois, uh, where my old stomping grounds are from, of course. Um, my dad is on because uh, he is probably the most potent and obviously earliest example of somebody in my life who taught me, regardless of where you come from, what you have against you, uh, just to keep pushing through and, and hoping for the best. Uh, that's a very oversimplified way of putting it, but I wanted to have him on. Um, and it, actually, the idea occurred to me on Father's Day itself after we had a conversation. So, uh, Dad, welcome to the show. Thank you. So, it all begins in a rural town in, uh, in, in Missouri, Lebanon, I believe? Yes. And um, I'll just kind of guide us here, and, I'll, and, and feel free to just chime in uh, in general. Um, my understanding is you were born to uh, grandma and grandpa, and uh, from a very, very early age, you uh, grew up in a pretty poor home, uh, not very well-to-do family uh, s situation in general, and you were sickly right off the bat. Uh, that You had what I remember as spinal meningitis at the age of about two. Is that correct? Well, actually, about probably four months old. Oh, okay. So even earlier um, in your infancy. And um, why don't you tell us the story of, of basically what happened there, um, how it was discovered, and really the, 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 really the story about you going to the hospital and, and them kind of catching it. Well, when I was four months old, my, uh, both my parents took me around to like several different doctors to find out what exactly was going on with me. Some doctors said that I had rickets. Uh, some people said, or some doctors said that I was very malnutrition. I had I, uh, malnourished. nutrition, malnourished, yes. And, uh, but it was just several different things, but they did not know exactly what was going on with me. Well, then this one doctor, uh, talked to my parents and he said, I don't know what this baby has, but if you don't get him into uh, Columbia University in one hour, uh, he is probably going to die. So at that, uh, my mom and my grandma and my dad uh, got me in the car, I, we took off, and uh, I was laying in the seat, um, as crazy as it sounds, my back of my feet, I bent backwards and it touched the back of my head. And uh, mm. my eyes rolled back. They thought I was dying right then. Well, my dad like rushed to the hospital. Uh, a police officer pulled us over and said, follow me, uh, put a white rag on the uh, on the uh, handle of your car, and uh, we took off. Well, then uh, my dad actually went around the police officer and went to the hospital and <laughs> handed me over to the the nurse, and they took me in, and uh, they said that if I wasn't there, you know, like in within 15 minutes, I'd have probably died. Well, then through that, um, as I was growing up, it was, uh, I had like, I couldn't like even run right. Uh, I couldn't run almost at all. Uh, I was very thin. My uh, nervous system was kind of like shot. And uh, I had a really hard time in school, uh, learning anything, you know, stuff like that. It really messed me up. Mm -hmm. And well, as, time progressed my mom uh my mom and dad got a divorce and uh they were very young when my mom was 21 when they she had me my dad was 23 uh my dad went to prison twice uh my mom and dad had four kids a year apart right in a row and uh, my sister, when my mom was uh, giving birth to her, my mom almost died. Mm. And then I came out 
and I had spinal meningitis right away. My brother, Richard Preston, uh, he was mentally challenged and uh, had a lot of physical problems. And then Wesley was born, my youngest brother, uh, or my youngest full brother, put it that way. Um, he was perfectly healthy, happy baby. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mom was pretty much at her wit's end because my father was in prison uh, off and on. And uh, she had these sickly kids. And uh, yeah, yeah. so... As I grow, as I grew up, and everything like that, the challenges and stuff like that with uh, being hard in school and uh, uh, my physical uh, problems, I uh, then from there it was just like I don't. I was a great follower for a while, and uh, I uh, had uh, I didn't have a lot of confidence in myself mm, okay so therefore I, I when i went and then my mom started like she met a a, a man his name was Les, and uh, married him he was my stepfather we moved to joliet from missouri and uh he got a job at caterpillar and we were doing pretty good uh, we uh lived in uh little neighborhood called Bridal Wreath Acres. Everything was going pretty well. Then my brother, Richard Preston, uh, passed away at uh, five years old from double pneumonia and measles. Mm. And then uh, we were doing pretty good. Then Les, my stepfather, he got MS. And uh, oh, he had to go that. in yeah, he had to go into the nursing home. Uh, he went down real fast, put it that way. And mm. when he went to the nursing home, he lost his job. And my mom really financially struggled. We were in a middle class neighborhood. And uh, all my friends had new clothes, uh, had everything that they wanted. And uh, it was very hard on me. I, mm -hmm. I took that real hard because my mom was struggling. She was too uh, prideful for me to say anything to anybody about our situation. And uh, we, me and Teresa, my older sister, she's a year older than I am, and Wesley, we struggled. And, and the two younger ones that are Vicky and John were uh, that when they were born and everything, they came up, uh, they seen a little bit of it, but we got the brunt of it all, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, when my stepdad and my mother punished, uh, they did it quick, decisive, and, and it, they call it probably child abuse now, but mm. it was uh, old school uh, punishments uh, with switches and belts and stuff like that. And uh, it was, uh, like they say, what the guy said, uh, my parents were very patriotic. Uh, they laid down the stripes and I seen stars. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. God. That's great. Yeah. yeah, it was at the time. But my mom had a lot of... Uh, hardships and a lot of you know uh things going against her for a while mm -hmm. and she was struggling herself and she was young on top of it uh but as well, i grew up oh, if we ahead. if we if i can just add to this point i mean i, I again I've, i'm piecing together all the stories from growing up and you telling me about it but um it, it sounded like that was i mean that was one factor of course of just like the new uh the stepfather situation and that was that was tough and um, you know, I, I mean, I think there's just a lot of things even in that that are very, I'm sure very hard to like think about or talk about. But then in addition to that, your own father, Grandpa Ralph, um, you know, he, he's rumored to have fathered what, 20, 20 something, maybe 30 kids in, throughout Missouri. Well, I like would that? say, I would say more like, uh, best I could figure 
was like 18. That's the best I can figure. And, and uh, if there was more, I don't know. But, yeah. you know, yeah, he lived in every state in the United States, uh, except for Hawaii, mm. married several different times, and uh, had kids by a lot of different females, <laughs> a lot of women. I mean, yeah. he, you know, it's again, just looking back at it from the, through the lens of a 31 year old now on the stories that I heard when I was a kid, it's just like, you understand how these things happen. It was, it was, you know, a rural state for the most part. And he was a good looking man. Like he, he yes. had a way about him that, you know, women found attractive and he knew how to talk and speak. And, and it's not to speak ill of him, you know, um, and, and, or anything like that. He, he seemed to have found his way towards the end of life and whatnot, but, um, I wanted to just kind of add the context of just like the situation that you grew up in from a parenthood perspective, um, both, both by birth and by marriage, um, was very, very problematic, uh, at times is very, there was a lot of lack of structure. Um, yeah. I, I would, I think it's safe to say that it was, there was abuse going on, like, you know, in general, definitely today, that's for sure. Uh, we would call it that. Um, but, uh, you know, I would say just the emotional and psychological abuse that comes with it. And um, yes. I think you were alluding to the fact, not to tell your story for you, but um, alluding to the fact of like how when you have this really stressful situation of your parents, uh, your parents, um, and your mother particularly who's alone, and then you're a child who she attributes all these problems by birth with, um, she did not have the emotional capacity to be able to handle that. So um, it was just you... Yeah, really, really bad situation. But please continue. Uh, I want to just really emphasize the context of that and how it was coming from all angles. Right. Yeah. And, and uh, like as I grew up, uh, by the time I was 11 years old, I worked on a farm. Um, <laughs> as crazy as this sounds, uh, I, me and my brother, we started smoking cigarettes about seven. I was seven. He was five. <laughs> just playing around with them. Uh, the teenage boys uh, would take us in the cornfield and all the, my friends and us, and they would feed us this, these cigarettes and think it was funny. And uh, <laughs> by the time I was 11, uh, I smoked in the house. Uh, my mom oh my said God. if I could buy cigarettes, I could uh, buy my own cigarettes, I could smoke in the house. Uh, I, as I grew up, uh, I did, like you say, I did not really know my dad too well. He would see me uh, for short periods of time. Uh, and then by the time I was 16, I was going to high school, all this stuff, and then uh, working, keeping my hair cut for back in that era, somewhat, you know, and, uh, but, uh, it was the era of time in the seventies when people wore a little longer hair or a lot longer hair. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I told my mom, I want to marry or marry. I want to move with my dad. And, uh, she said, no, you don't. And, uh, <laughs> but I, <laughs> I didn't know, I didn't know. Him. I, so I moved with my dad and, uh, I dropped into a very, very different life. I, Dropped out of high school. Um, I actually got dropped out of high school three times. Uh, <laughs> I uh, you dropped yeah, out, I, joined I, again, dropped out, joined again, dropped out, joined again. Right. Wow. And uh, well, a little quick note on that. I was uh, I didn't have my even my freshman credits, and I went to a high school, and the principal uh, put me up into the junior year gave me the credits and said, if you just stay in school, you'll graduate. Well, I dropped out again. And he told me, <laughs> he was very angry at me when I dropped out the third time. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, but at, at the same time, it was like, <laughs> I, when I, I moved from Joliet to Peoria, I moved into a situation where my dad was a bouncer in a bar, uh, in a nightclub and uh i was more or less one of his friends he hung around with uh a lot of different guys that were 
very shady characters, <laughs> and uh, I was just one of them. I drank a lot, uh, a lot, three, four times a week, heavily, and um, recovering, uh, you know, on, uh, on my off days, um, hangovers and all that. Um, like I said, I didn't go to school. I didn't work. Um, I just partied and uh, mm. dated uh, uh, grown women and girls at that time. Whoa. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, uh, and from there, and I'm not bragging, it, it's, uh, it wasn't a good situation. It's not as good as it sounds. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> from there, uh, we moved to Missouri from Peoria, my dad and me, and my brother, Wesley. And uh, when we moved there, that helped a lot. Because, I mean, I still partied, I still drank, I smoked a lot of pot, whatever, I did drugs. Um, but at least it was more, uh, I was around family. Uh, my grandma was around, all that. That I think that uh, was my saving grace for a while. Uh, from what I was doing in Peoria. And you're how old at this uh, point? 16, I think I was, maybe turning 17. Okay. But uh, we moved into a house that uh, my aunt was living on the corner. We were living on one side of her. And then my dad's first cousin was living up the street uh, or like right next to us from there. Well, all the boys, the cousins were pretty close to the same age. And um, we partied and partied. Well, then me and Danny, my cousin Danny, we started lifting weights, working out, doing all this stuff. And oh, prior to that, uh, I went, I took karate um, and I took a little boxing. Um, but it was all to like straighten out my coordination, uh, just straighten out my my health or my physical health but I was still smoking still partying and stuff like that and then um I moved back to Joliet fell into the same crowd I was in and then our, our bad crowd that I grew up with and things progressively got worse and I was getting into like a lot of trouble accidents all this stuff but what I did was I would run from Joliet to P or Missouri to escape the trouble from here and vice versa. As soon as I got in a lot of trouble down there, I would come up here, you know, mm -hmm. and try to start a new, start, start a new. But uh, let's see, up there, then, uh, then I moved to, to Missouri and I met some uh, a woman that was nine years older than me. I was 22 and she was 31. Oh, uh, wow. moved, she asked me out five times and I didn't go out with her. And then on the sixth time I took her home and stayed with her for five years. Uh, what? <laughs> yeah. I didn't know this. Well then, but my drinking <laughs> progressively got worse. I got thrown in jail a lot. Uh, then I, um, I was kind of like at the end of my rope. I was just like, I was 25 years old uh, by that time, and uh, I didn't have really nothing going for me. I was working, but I was just constantly hung over, constantly just a mess, you know, mm -hmm. living my life or drinking, basically. But uh, then um, at 25 years old, this is like a pivoting point in my life. I um, was sitting in a bar day after St. Patty's Day, uh, 1982, and uh, it just came to me, stop, I'm going to quit drinking. And uh, I quit drinking. It's kind of a little emotional right now. But uh, I quit drinking, and uh, it just... Um, I never went back. I never drank another drop of alcohol. To this and day. I, to this day, I, uh, 38 years later, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. um, but it, uh, when I quit drinking, 
I had, that was the start of the change of my life. I uh, went to church. Uh, <laughs> it was so funny. I went to this Methodist church. I had, I grew up in church and I didn't even know what it was all about. Mm. Uh, I was incoherent in those years, <laughs> but uh, I was very curious about it. And there was an older preacher man, unattractive guy in a very, very small town. And uh, I would sit in the back of the room because I didn't want anybody talking to me or being around me. But I was just trying to take in the information that they had. And uh, he, this man, had such a heart for God, I could not believe it. And he, when he, he would sing, and when he sang, it was terrible. <laughs> he, he couldn't sing at all, but he would belt out those hymns and stuff. But I admired him. I just admired him for who he was and how he was. Mm -hmm. And, but that was, that was giving me hope, I guess. And then once I, I started going to AA and I said, oh, I'm an alcoholic because I thought I had to say I was an alcoholic because I was in the room with alcoholics. <laughs> and, uh, but mm. I, I said the words and then they were giving their little testimonies around the table. And by the time it got back to me, I was like, oh my God, they're talking about me. They, they, they oh, I could wow. direct, directly relate to these people. And, and so I got into AA and I got me a sponsor. I got all this stuff and uh, very good people helped me, saved my life. Uh, church saved my soul and uh, AA saved my life. And uh, what, hmm. but the thing, uh, it just gave me another perspective on life. Uh, and it took me about a, a year to clear my mind from the alcohol. And, and I literally, you know, and uh, then people started talking to me and noticing me and stuff like that. And they were like, Ted, you look 10 years younger. You look so much better. And uh, they weren't kidding, you know. And uh, so I just started like running, uh, exercising, uh, quit, I quit smoking. Um, I ran a lot uh, and exercised a lot. And then um, the girl that I, or the woman I was with at the time, uh, she could read a book like in an afternoon. And I was like, uh, I, was, I was impressed by that. And I was impressed so much by that because I couldn't read at all. And I was I like, you know, uh, in my 20s. So, yeah. What I, I just want to I just want to stop on that really quickly and just just point out the the emphasis of that. Um, I just th I think if people that li listen to this or watch this and they know you at all, um, to understand how devoted you are to reading today and where you are today and how you are today, it's it's really shocking to hear <clears throat> the kind of state that you're in at the age of 25 years old, which is you know it's not a young age like in a lot of ways it's, it's, you know, people are entering into adulthood or becoming adults at that point in general. And you are basically illiterate, alcoholic, using drugs, jail. And with this woman who is nine years older than you at this point, which is, so she's in her early, early to mid thirties. Um, and you have this moment and everything starts changing and, and unraveling. But anyways, you're still with this woman and um, you admire her ability to read and you decide I'm going to go from not even knowing how to read at all at 25 or 26 to uh, changing my, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just dive right in and, and try to learn this, this new thing. Right. Okay. Yes. And I took a book. It was a Stephen King novel called the beast from within. And uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> oh, that's, that's a funny book I, ironic name. Yeah. Yes, it was a very like crazy book, but Stephen King is a horror, you know, uh, uh, novelist. Novelist, yes. Uh, but at any rate, I took the book and I took the first page 
it took me about 20 times to read that page before I could understand what it said on the paper, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was, I think I was like hooked on phonics. I, yeah. I, I bought that to learn how to sound out vowels, all wow. that stuff. That is just yeah. so remarkable. Honestly, I, again, I, I'm just going to stop on the points I think it really should be emphasized, which is you're 26, I guess at this point, 25, 26 or years 25. old. 25. 25, you, yeah. you humbled yourself enough to say like you went, you went to the store or wherever we had to go and like bought hooked on phonics knowing this for you, for you as an adult, because you wanted to learn, you wanted to do this. And I, I just think, I just think that that should be highlighted in general that most people, when they're set in stone, they they're too embarrassed uh, to go over. So that's just, that's just one example of how you move past that stuff. But yeah. So you bought hooked on phonics. Yeah. I, and I, I, you know, as well as I do, I'm very mm -hmm. driven, but uh, I, it took me 20 times to kind of understand the, what was on the page, but I didn't quit. I just kept reading, kept reading, kept reading. Uh, and I finished the book. And by the time I finished the book, I could comprehend just reading the page like maybe one or two times. So, I mean, <laughs> it took me a while, but I, yeah. I, I was determined to do it. But then it was like I was progressing. I was just like, uh, I had stopped drinking all this stuff. Well, the girl that I was with, she was still drinking and she was still running with a, you know, the bad crowd. And uh, I, she came to me and she said, oh, I'm sorry, this is before I, I went to AA. I'm sorry about that. Uh, before I went to AA, she came to me, she gave me the big book of AA. It's like the Bible of the AA program. And she said, Ted, if I'm going to stop drinking, I'm going to have to go to AA. And that's when I threw the book, I said, look, I sobered up on my own. Uh, you can do it if you want it. Well, wow. she, mm. she continued to drink and continued continue to bring a lot of problems in our life. So I was like, well, maybe I ought to check out AA. And that's how I got started in AA is because <laughs> she, she wanted to go to AA to get sober. And I went because she went and then found out yeah, I belong here, you know. Wow. But at any rate, uh, oh, a little story too. I sobered up. She went into rehab, and she was like sixty miles away from me. I went this. Uh, I went to, to visit her in the hospital. I was in an old beat up pickup truck, and uh, it was in Jefferson City, Missouri. And uh, when I came back, it was raining so bad it flooded out the main roads. So I didn't know where I was at. So if you know anything about Missouri, you can go through these real, there's bluff there, bluffs there, and you can fall off and go 500 feet down. Uh, it's hard to see these winding roads mm -hmm. and it was pouring down rain. And uh, so I was thinking at that time about my life. And, and this was, just as I started AA, all this stuff, and I started to cry. And I was lost. I was lost in my life. I was lost, you know, all this. And then I was going through there, and I was praying to God to please not only save my life at that time be it from falling off the, like, cliff or whatever because mm -hmm. of the narrow roads. I was praying to change my life and to... Uh, how would you say, um, I was just praying for, yeah, a complete change in my life. Well, then all of a sudden it stopped raining and I look and it's like, I was right at the corner. It was three miles to my house. Oh, wow. And, and, but I didn't go home. I went to this little town, Swedesburg, Missouri, that's 250 people in this little old shack and me and this other guy, we talked about AA, we talked about God, we talked about all, and we were, we talked about that all night long. And I, hmm. I mean, those, I, I'll never forget those times. But uh, 
Yeah, I mean, it's a really got- powerful moment. I mean, how can you... <laughs> How can you de- not deny the coincidence of that moment of just like, I mean, that's, that's hard to, uh, that's hard to attribute to, to anything else, but yeah. Yeah. And I, I think I've even told you this when I sobered up, uh, that night when I was with that bartender, I was, it was me and a bartender and I slid the bottle over and I said, I'm done. And he knew me, he knew how bad I was. And he's like, ah, you'll be back tomorrow. And, I, and, and just at that moment, in my heart, in my mind, or whatever, I felt like, you know, it was the Spirit of God relieving me of that at that time. Hmm. So let's, um, let's fast forward uh, really quickly to, uh, so you're, you're in your mid-20s, you make this uh, proclamation, this really official proclamation, uh, because of a movement in your heart. Um, you have this moment on the mountain where you're, you know, it's raining and it stops and you ask God to save you and he does. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you start really taking concrete intentional actions towards these things to make your life better and it's working. It's really, really making a change. So, um, I presume, um, that you and this, this woman, uh, somehow break up eventually. It just kind of fizzles out. Uh, that's my understanding of the story. And let's, let's just go, uh, unless you want to tap into that, um, let's go a couple years. Go ahead. Oh, well, one thing I'd like to say about that, uh, the relationship, I moved to Joliet with her and we got a place and I went to work and I met your mother. And, uh, Mm. when I met your mom, I, uh, I went home to Paulette, the other girl, <laughs> and uh, I said, well, I'm going to go work out. But I didn't, I, I, I was going to lie to her. And then I sat down and I said, look, I met this girl at my job and uh, she's more my age. She wants to have what I want to have, family, all this stuff. And I'm going to go meet her, talk to her. And I did. And that was... Uh, how I met your mother. I mean, I met her. Wow. Yes. Yeah. See, you guys leave out little things here and there. I didn't know that. First of all, I didn't know that you guys were still together when this happened. And then you were just like, Hey, by the way, I met this other woman and like, you're not cutting it. Sorry. Which I'm, I'm simplifying, of course, I'm being silly, but like, you know, you, you, it's like, Hey, I met this woman. Like she's really something, you know, she's, there's something to this. And, and you and me, what we have is just not, um, it's not in line with, you know, destiny or whatever you wanted it want to say or whatever you want to be. It's like, this is not what my future is. And uh, yeah. you were bold enough to just go say that. So, okay. So, so you meet mom and you just, you know, you break up with, with this woman and, um, and then I broke up with your mom. And then, then about three months later, I went back and knocked on the door and, <gasps> and begged her to go out with me again. Yeah. I know a little bit more about that part. And yes, yes. So there was a, a little, well, yeah. it, it's not a completely um, uh, Disney Channel romantic story, but it's uh, nonetheless, it's uh, it's still um, it's just noteworthy. another example. Mm-hmm. No, it's very noteworthy. It's obviously, I mean, I'm here because of that, but it's like what's noteworthy about it is it's another example of you um, knowing that this is kind of what you're wanting for yourself mm. in this in this life, and you are taking a deliberate unequivocal step towards making that happen. Um, and that's why, yes. I mean, I, I, again, I think it's just something to highlight because it's something that I believe that I have learned through trial and error, how to do very, very well as well. So, okay. So you meet mom, um, you guys, after some tribulations, you, you work it out. Um, you, uh, get married and, uh, you have me and Amanda, and this is the part where um, feel free to like highlight any stories that are important or, or make sense to you. But um, I want to I want to bring us forward into um, a little bit of our childhood, and then just kind of go, uh, fast forward to today. So the, okay. what I do want to what I do want to talk about with our childhood is is a theme where you discussed how when you grew up, your life was so difficult and um, tumultuous that uh, you you had mentioned you'd like imagine what it would like to be like to have a leave it to beaver family and, and that sort of thing. And, um, 
with your personality type, if anybody's an Enneagram follower, you're a perfectionist, a a one on the, on the scale. And you had this ideal of what your family was going to look like and be and that sort of thing. But we were still living, um, you were still living with, I think a lot of demons within you and things that you hadn't really known to work through. And so they come out in life circumstances, like being a, a, a husband and father and that sort of thing. So, um, so this is something we talked about a lot as, a, as kids with me, Amanda, and, and you and mom. Um, but you had this almost negative consequence of wanting to be the best father and husband and have the best life. Um, and how when, when reality didn't match up to that, that was, that was uh, very difficult for you. So I want to just like talk about that really quickly and then we'll move forward to, um, to kind of the last several years. Yeah, uh, with that, when I when uh, you kids were growing up and stuff like that, I wanted the life that, uh, like, I seen through other people, I thought, well, they have the perfect life when I was a kid, you know, yeah. and I tried to take bits and parts of their, their, their life or their story and, and make it my own, mm. you know, mm-hmm. well, uh, I worked a lot. I I worked a lot, a lot of overtime, crazy hours, all this stuff. And I missed a lot of things with you kids when you were little. And, uh, at the time I was there, here's my drive again. I was so driven to make something out of myself that I was, wasn't, I was blind to uh, what was around me, you know? And then, uh, your mom came to me and said, uh Ted the paychecks are real nice and all that but the kids don't see you and neither do I and I was like I you know I know yeah Mm -hmm. so what I did was um I worked a lot when I was in Summit Illinois uh in a in a factory and uh I uh did things like I raised you guys it was like quick decisive punishment uh, I didn't think things through too well, you know, and I carried some anger from my childhood and, uh, I like today, I greatly regret that, you know, but, uh, through those years and stuff like that, I, like you say, I was working through things and trying to be this better father, better husband, all these things. But like I, I had these certain demons in me, I guess, Mm -hmm. that I was wrestling with, fighting with, you know. Uh, Meanwhile, I was an elder in the church, and I uh, teach, I taught Bible study and all that stuff, too, and I think that's part of the perfectionist in me. Um, But all these things and stuff like that, all through my, uh, after I sobered up and straightened up and everything, I got my GED, I got all my licenses and stuff like that. Uh, I kept bettering and bettering myself on the job in Chicago. And then uh, I left that job. I started all over and I I bettered and bettered myself at the job that I'm at now. And then I'm pretty much at the top of my game there too. Mm -hmm. Uh, And nearing my retirement age. But uh, I just wanted so bad for you, your sister, your mom. Uh, my siblings, uh, the people that I know that was close to me, to, uh, I I didn't have an ego problem. I just wanted them to be able to look at me and see me for the success that I am and for uh, being a good father, good uh, brother, good uh, husband, you know. Listen, I mean, you have to, you have to like, I mean, I think anybody listening to this would would see that that is a natural consequence of having that mindset of somebody who is so driven. That there's a re, there's something that's behind that drive, right? There's something oh, yeah, behind absolutely. that drive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's, I'm sure a lot of it is driven by saying, "I will show you, I will show mm-hmm. you who I am and what I can do." And there's nothing wrong with that, um, you know. There, but there, again, there's there's always going to be consequences to that. And there's going to be that, that element of, you know, my worth is tied up with my, my 
actions and that sort of thing. And again, over time, you figure out how to find your own worth from within and it's, it's separate from your actions and that sort of thing. But the thing of your life was that you grew up in such a difficult situation, such a traumatic uh, situation where you were taught every single day that you meant less than other people near you and around you or yes, yes. Um, whatever it may be. So uh, for you to come up and feel the pride and joy of, of succeeding and rising above the others, it had to be almost like a drug, like a euphoria of, mm -hmm. I, I know it would be like that for me. So I don't think anybody can blame you for that. And I certainly don't blame you for wanting that perfectionism um, in, in how you raised me and whatnot. I, I have no regrets about how you raised me. You know, I, I wouldn't be where I am today if it weren't for that. So, um, you know, I, I want you to know that and, um, and that sort no, of thing. Thanks. So, yeah, of course. But, okay, so you got the job. You were in Chicago forever. I remember the long drives with mom uh, where we, I think he had, we had the one car at the time and, and we had the long drive to Chicago when we were going to pick you up, uh, you know, late at night when you worked those long, you know, 12, 16 hour shifts or whatever, you work a double or something at the box factory. And, um, you know, those, those were some fun times because me and Amanda and mom would play, uh, <laughs> uh, my father owned a grocery store uh, on the way up uh, to that. And we'd play that game in the car and, um, but nonetheless, uh, uh, you, you get the job at the, the, where you're at now and, you know, you've worked your way up to through the ranks there and it's just been a, really a testament to your consistent opportunity or um, desire to grow and be better and be better and almost an obsession, I would say, uh, for better mm -hmm. or for worse. Yes. Now, what I want to talk about next before we, before we get into kind of the, the closing part of the episode here is you reached a point right around the time that I was having my crisis, I would say, <laughs> a couple of years back, um, you reached a point in your own life where I think you, you said to me, essentially, you know, you feel, you feel like you're lacking purpose or drive in that way or um, a challenge yeah. in, or something that in that way. And we had a really stark conversation about like what it is that maybe was missing. Um, you want to go ahead and explain that conversation and really what, what happened afterwards? Yeah. Just I what you were going through. Yeah. I mean, I, I've had these like real highs in my life and I was dri driven, driven, driven. Uh, but then it's like, I lifted weights. I, I really succeeded at that. I ran, I really succeeded at that. It's like, I, I just, because of my drive, but at the same time, there was things, personal things in my life that was going on and within myself that I wasn't real happy with. And I, I started having a negative turn and, and I, I went into a very almost depressed type of, uh, uh, way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and I almost like, I, I didn't have no drive. I, you know, and, and that's not like me. And, uh, I, I was, it's like you're falling down into a, a well <laughs> and you know, you're falling, but you can't do nothing about it at the time. Yeah. But at any rate, uh, that's how I felt. I felt like, you know, uh, my life is going nowhere. But uh, hmm. what I did was I, I was talking to you and uh, you, su you suggested a couple of books. You gave me some books and stuff like that. I started reading those books and then I, I started uh, YouTubing and uh, looking for advice and help on, on YouTube. And, and it just expanded from there. And we had some talks as well. And uh, through those talks uh, and the books and the YouTube and your sister, <laughs> uh, your sister and me, we kind of butt heads sometimes. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, it seemed like I was rejecting what she was telling me a lot. But at the same time, I was, afterwards I was listening, you know, and, and I started like taking this stuff in and, and listening to us, I took the positive out of what you said, your sister said, and all this, and um, I started changing, changing the way I thought, 
I got up off my butt and started doing things and being more creative and stuff like that. And just uh, my life now, I feel is very good. You know, I mean, compared to a year or two, a couple of years ago, I was, I'm like a lot better and I, I feel more fulfilled again. You know, mm. I, um, but I, I, I want to say this. I believe that you have to have a spiritual, uh, you have to have spiritual time. You have to have uh, your exercise. I believe that you have to have your, your intellect. You have to read something, uh, get into something like that. And I believe you have to have your creative side. And when you have all four of those going, I believe that uh, you're a lot more happier and giving, giving to, giving back to the world. Mm. Almost yes, like you, I, you're, you're, you're chasing after that carrot uh, in life in general. Like you may be, you're just enjoying the run, but there's always that carrot in front of you that you're going after. There's always that challenge or next thing that you, that you're going after. And, and, and you know, I, I want to, you know, just say, I, I think I, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine about this yesterday, the opposite of what we're talking about now, which is many people um, who are looking back on their, their, their earlier stages in life and thinking of that as the quote glory days and how um, really depressing that is. And, um, you know, do you think that for a while, um, when you had this this moment in a couple of years back or whenever that we we started having these conversations, um, did you think that maybe that's what was going on with you is like you were thinking of like these ta- these these momentous things throughout your life that you had gone through and overcome, and now you have fallen into this rut of like okay i've I've climbed the mountain i've I've done everything and now i ha- I don't have a challenge in front of me like, do you think maybe right. that's what was going on or, or um yes. Yes, I do. Yeah, I, uh, and now, like I say, I'm getting into a lot of carpentry stuff now and a lot of uh, woodworking stuff and all that stuff. And I'm very interested in that. And and it's kind of odd because my brother Wesley and my dad was interested in that kind of stuff too. Hmm. But it's like when I build something or I do something uh, and I can look at it when it's done, completed, and it looks really nice, Mm -hmm. that's great satisfaction to me. I am very, it fulfills me in one, in one way, not always, but one way. And like I say, you know, uh, my spiritual life, my exercising, uh, giving to people, you know, Mm -hmm. stuff like that, all these things, when you put them all together and stuff like that, it, it makes me anyway, and I believe it would make anybody uh, more fulfilled, you know, yeah. and, and happier. You know, I have a purpose. I have, you need a purpose in life. And I have those purposes in my life, you know. I, I agree with you entirely. I mean, you're coming up on the time of, of retirement where, you know, a lot of people will just hang their hat and, you know, call it a day. But um, I, I think we can all agree that um, you need to have that next thing that you pour yourself into, um, whether that's other people, or I should say that's a balance between other people and yourself. Um, what, what I, what I see happening all around me, you, our family, our friends, um, are, you know, folks that spend their life living for others and they never truly, they never really look from in, in, within themselves of, of what their own value is, what they bring to the table. Therefore, if they can find value in serving others um, or serving some other master, if you will, um, their job or you know whatever it may be, uh, they never really have to look from within. But it seems like a couple of years ago, that was like this pivotal moment for you to start looking at yourself um, on a deep level um, in ways... Uh, and challenging yourself in ways intellectually and also um, thinking about your childhood and your upbringing and how you, the, the way you think and that sort of thing in ways that, that you just never have after, you know, 60 plus years in this earth. And I think that's, that's really remarkable. Um, and I, I just don't know many people your age and have gone through 
um, any sort of stage in, in their life where they take uh, almost pre-retirement or retirement age to reinvent themselves in that way. It's, it's just not, it doesn't happen. Um, yeah. yeah. Because, you know, I, I think we just take our, our station in life and we accept it for what it is. So that leads me to my, one of my last questions here. W- what would you say, <laughs> what would you say to 10 year old Ted or Teddy, I guess at that, at that point, um, if you could go back in a different body, it's not you, he doesn't know he's, he doesn't know it's you. Um, what would you tell him if you could, um, knowing what you know now? I would tell him that you're unique and that uh, don't listen to what people say to you or about you. And uh, you have gifts that you don't really know that you have and uh, that you need to continue to explore them. And uh, things are going to be really good for you in the future. I got a little emotional listening to that. I get a little love right there right now. Um, um, <laughs> well, I'm definitely your son because um, that that hit me in a in a certain way uh, as well. I think I tie a lot of my <clears throat> my worth to um, what I do and and how I make people feel um, in that way instead of just you know knowing that the worth is there. And, and I think there's value on both sides, but um, yeah, I don't know if I could have said that any better <laughs> myself. Um, that is, is there anything else that you want to add, uh, to this story and to this message before we sign off? Well, what I, I've mentored many, many different people in my day and, uh, to all people, uh, that's listening to this, it's like, if you feel stuck, if you feel um, like you can't, you don't have nothing to offer, you have gifts and you have things with inside you that are so unique uh, and you just haven't tapped into that. And that uh, once you find your true self, who you are, there's the sky's the limit. You know, you, you, there ain't no, Ain't no telling where you can go, you know. And uh, I know many people out there that are stuck and they're uh, living the same life and they're, you know, like it's a day after day type of thing that uh, they don't, it's a shame that they don't know what kind of unique potential that they do have. Mm -hmm. And uh, all I would say is find it, find that potential within yourself. It's uh, every episode I do, I find uh, a new insight that ties into kind of the things that I've realized over the years myself and that sort of thing. And what I'm realizing the most right now is that you are the person that taught me to think the way that I do um, and to really believe that what I bring to the table is worth it, um, even if it doesn't seem like it at that time. And uh, I think every great entrepreneur, or businessman, or, or you know, achiever of any kind, and their their discipline has, um, they've either had a cheerleader or they've been that cheerleader for themselves. And um, you were definitely that for me growing up. And now I've I've uh, learned to be self sufficient in in that in myself. So um, that's a perfect segue. And I'll say that's the whole premise of this entire show, which is to find your thing that drives right. you. Find your thing. And it's hard. It's that that first step is very hard, which is why I have the exercise, which is why I coach people through it, and I and I help people to to even intentionally spend time on that topic in and of itself, because finding your thing is even is is just as important as actually seeing it through. You can't have the second without the first. So, um, I'm starting to see now where I, I got that drive to do to do that uh, finding my thing thing. So, um. Isn't it, isn't it something that, you know, uh, you, you do a, like, you do all these things in life that uh, seems to be a dr- drudgery 
But if you think more positively and you think more clearly and you get your life on track, my job's going great. Uh, my, my house, my life, my everything is going good. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm more at peace. And it doesn't seem like I'm driving forward. It just seems like I'm doing and I'm enjoying it. And, you know, the, if there was a formula that made this your life what it is, I think, I think it was some, you know, at some points along the way, you heard this message, you heard this hope, you heard this like idea that there could be, you could live a better life, even if it didn't come from your family, your environments or whatever it was, but you heard this <laughs> open, you knew it existed. Yeah. And you had that desire within you. Maybe that was the reason that you had the desire within you to, to springboard, springboard and seek out that truth. But what happened was you basically latched onto a truth, a dynamic, a, a system um, of discipline, drive, and really um, uh, finding your way through work, um, through working it out. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is you, I don't think you knew where your good intentions were going to take you. You just knew that that was the way you needed to go and you trusted that and you trusted yourself. And here you are, you know, for almost 40 years later, um, two children who love you and are living good lives, living out their dreams and what they want to do. A, a beautiful wife who is, is also, um, She's, it sounds like mom's going through her own transformation these days and slowly but surely. And um, she's challenging herself and at, at near retirement age. And even if, in, even if it's at her own pace, she's still challenging herself. And that's something that a lot of people don't do. Um, and I just, I just couldn't be more proud of you and her and um, really more thankful for um, your example to me. I, I don't, I definitely wouldn't be me um, in any sort of capacity without you. So thank you for that. <laughs> No, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I do what I can. So um, with that, I, I think we'll sign off. Uh, Dad, thanks so much for coming on. And um, I think we should definitely do it again. Uh, just a different topic this time, now that people know who you are. Okay, yeah. Awesome. Very good. All right. Love you. I will uh, talk to you soon. I love you too. Have a good night. See ya. Bye-bye.